Hello everybody. In this video I'm going to cover the various preparatory steps you need to take in relation to granularity before you begin modelling. Getting the granularity of your modelling correct is of fundamental importance to building predictive models that you can explain and which provide valuable business insight. Remember the claim reserves are the cornerstone of the company and will feed into capital, planning and pricing decisions. So we need to ensure our work is providing insight and we also need to be able to justify it and explain what we've done to our peers, our management and our auditors. So it's well worth your time giving granularity serious thought every time you want to use the chain letter method. Unfortunately, the first thing to learn about granularity is that there's no correct answer. Actual reserving is an art as much as a science. So although there are some clear bad granularities to model, e.g. everything together, there are also many potential good granularities you could use, and we need to strike the correct balance between conflicting demands. Adding more and more segments will be helpful for creating homogeneous data sets to model. A homogeneous data set would involve grouping together policies that have similar characteristics, which is key for avoiding drawing incorrect trends and predicting them forwards. Adding more and more segments will be helpful to enable us to provide greater insight as we will draw out the different characteristics and profitability of more and more areas. This will be helpful for us in explaining and justifying our work, as well as providing insights to key decision makers. It will involve more and more work though, and this can be a challenge if your deadlines are near and your resources are small. Unfortunately, adding more and more segments also means we will have less and less data in each of our modeling segments, which means we will struggle to get our models to be predictive or stable. On the flip side, as we reduce the number of model segments, we'll find we can model much more quickly. I can bash out a quick whole account chain ladder in a few minutes. The problem is that I'll try to model a massively heterogeneous data set, full of policies with differing characteristics, and so my model is unlikely to be well founded or predictive due to all the confounding trends. So as a naturally, you will need to find the correct level of granularity for your needs. However, it doesn't end there. The regulator may need you to report your reserves at a specific, often quite high level, and so you will need to ensure your modelling segments can, can be aggregated to the required level. Management and underwriters will often want more and more insight and challenge you to include more and more modelling segments. There are some solutions here. For instance, you could model at the technically correct level and then use allocation techniques to get results at the more granular level, which suits decision makers. You should also ensure that the additional segments requested by management are long-term needs rather than short-term asks, in which case they should be removed when possible, which I do appreciate is often easier said than done. So you need to think about granularity every time you model. And don't be afraid to push back if the segmentation has got unwieldy, or look to break up large model segments to provide more insight. We spoke a little in the last video about triangles. Granularity of data in the claim number and amount triangles is very important for building predictive, insightful models. Let's imagine this is a paid claims triangle, which we've gathered from the claims database for a given class. We're going to put all the data relating to claims where the insured event occurred in the 2011 calendar year in the first row, i.e. the 2011 accident year row. We're going to sum up all the payments made relating to those claims by the end of March 2011 and put this number, say £1 million, in the first column of the first row. Then we'll add up all the payments made relating to those claims by the end of June 2011, and put these, this number, say 3 million, in the second row of that first row, second column of the first row, excuse me. We're going to use a database tool to do this. Now, there are a lot of calculations, but you get the idea that we can fill up this triangle with data. The oldest accident year, 2011, will have all the way up to 40 quarters of data, running up to the end of December 2020, while the newest accident year, 2020, we only have four quarters of the data, hence the triangle shape. But that's not the only way we could do it. Instead, we could group our origin periods into accident quarters or accident months, or we could group them into underwriting years. So our, now our 2011 origin period is our underwriting year, which contains all the claims relating to policies that were sold to customers in the 2011 calendar year. And again, we could have that as underwriting quarters or underwriting months. We could even group our origin periods into notification years. So here the 2011 notification year would contain all claims 
notified to the insurer in 2011, regardless of when the policy was sold or the insured event occurred. All these three options for origin periods are valid, and used appropriately can help to produce accurate and insightful models. Of course, using the wrong type will do the opposite, so do ensure you know what's required before selecting your origin period type. Also be careful that you don't try to combine segments with different origin period types as you'll end up with something nonsensical. We could also choose to group our development periods into months or years rather than quarters. So how do we know what's appropriate to use? For the origin period type, it will be necessary to understand how the policies you are modelling were written and their coverage basis. Some policies are sold on a claims made basis, which naturally suits using notification period as your origin period type. Accident period data sees claim develop quicker as they skip the gap in the policy life cycle between the policies being written and the claims occurring. So this is a very common basis to use. Underwriting period data provides most insight to underwriters and management who can easily track the performance of business written over time, whereas accident year results are a mix of policies written in different time periods. Again, it's possible to allocate results between different bases, and so it may be best to pick the most appropriate origin type on a technical basis and then allocate to any others required. Choosing origin period length is very much driven by the balance we discussed earlier. Going monthly may provide great insight, but there may be too little data in each origin month and your model may get unwieldy, whereas going longer might make spotting trends that much harder. One important trend to be aware of here is seasonality. Certain insured events are much more likely to occur at certain times of year. Insurance policies subject to weather perils will be an obvious case here, as they will see higher claims in different seasons. Lastly, development period length is similarly driven by the balance we discussed earlier. Monthly can sometimes give you too much data, whereas annual development just blurs the insight you need. However, some policies may have such a long period between insured events occurring and claims settling that annual development is more appropriate. Having considered our triangle site, we also need to consider how to split our data into modelling segments. As discussed, this is a subjective decision but one which the policy life cycle can really help you to make. The first step of the policy life cycle was a customer purchasing an insurance policy from an insurer. And this is the natural first place to consider around segmentation. We group policies depending on which channel the customer came from, for instance, direct, broker, online aggregator, and this is going to drive out lots of useful management information. But it will also drive differences in the type of risk each customer brings and how they will react if an insured event occurs. Similarly, the class of business purchased, for instance, motor, property, liability, credit, is again going to be of huge interest to management and will also strongly influence the frequency of insured events and the cost of those claims. Going deeper, many policies will be exposed to multiple claim types, for example, home damage, third party damage, third party liability, and or perils, for example, fire or storm. Some of these coverages are optional and all are likely to bring differences in frequency of insured events and the cost of those claims. Lastly, the region the customer hails from, be it country, state, province, region, or more precise location, will be of utmost importance to management and also can bring different types of risk and reaction to insured events, not to mention different legal jurisdictions. So you can't go far wrong by considering these key policy features when deciding on segmentation. However, if we keep moving along the policy life cycle, we find a whole host of other potential drivers of heterogeneity. Firstly, are the different coverage periods being provided within each of our modelling segments? Annual policies are pretty ubiquitous, but not always, and it's easy to check this in your policy database. Policies with longer coverage periods will naturally see more claims and later notification of those claims, so it's important to know if these exist and to consider isolating them from the more standard policies. If you spot a growing number of non-standard policy lengths over time, this can be a sign of something fishy going on in the underwriting function which you should be investigating carefully. The coverage may also differ between policies, particularly with commercial insurance, where the insurer may take the whole risk or just parts of it. Again, you need to understand where such differences occur and you need to consider allowing for them in your segmentation. It would be great to consider policies with different insured event rates. But as discussed, we only know about the claims which are notified, so next we should consider claim frequency and notification rate. Getting a handle on the number of claims which will hear a policy or group of policies is really important for assessing the cost of those claims 
We want to isolate policies with a long notification lag from those where claims come in quickly. Similarly, by separately considering policies with high or low frequency of claims, will help you to confidently assess and set claim frequency for more immature origin periods. If you combine high and low po frequency policies together, then changes in mix between these two types can cause your total claim frequency to vary unexpectedly over time, and thus reduces your confidence in your projection of recent origin periods. Next, you need to consider the average cost or severity of claims, which will, which will arise in policies. Some policies will naturally attract large claims, for instance, commercial policies or riskier private policies. And this will impact the assessment and settlement stages of the policy life cycle. Simple, smaller claims might flow naturally onto standard case reserves and settle quickly and within expectations, however larger or complex claims may not fit standard case reserves at all, can be hard to put considered case estimates onto, can be influenced by internal and external claim handling practices and changes, can often lead to disputes and court cases and will generally take much longer to settle. When you consider these differences, it's not surprising that many actuaries want to separate small and large claims in some way when modelling. I'll talk more about how you can assess this shortly. Lastly, when claims are settled with customers, there is the final stage of dealing with co-insurance, reinsurance and salvage. These can differ by customer, policy and claim type, so worth considering in your segmentation, but generally this is just something you need to deal with in your models and can't easily be segmented away. The only example I can really recall of this being regularly used in, is in the Lloyds market, where sometimes there will be a net retained class, which is a set of super policies which the underwriters don't want to cede at all to reinsurers, but this is not a common example. As we know now, reserving is an art, not a science, so there's no one-size-fits-all approach to take here. However, it's worth considering the size and efficiency of your modelling team, which might just be you, and the efficiency of your reserving processes when making this decision. It's also worth considering the purpose of the modelling. More segments means more insight, so less segments might be better if you're more focused on adequacy of reserves this time around. You may consider the minimum levels of premium and or claims which need to be in your smallest segments to enable you to have sufficient data. This will vary depending on the size of the insurer and the type of business being written, so you'll need to develop your own rules of thumb here. It's also worth considering the data you have in your biggest and smallest data sets. If even your biggest segments contain unstable data, which will be difficult to model, then you've probably gone too granular with your segmentation. Conversely, if even your smallest segments look highly stable, then you probably have room to go more granular, if there's a business driver and the time to do so. Of course, if you want to let a machine make the decision, then k-means clustering is a machine learning algorithm, which could do this for you based on all the characteristics we just discussed. However, it's not widely used yet. It could take you down some interesting rabbit holes. If you have done this successfully, I'd love to hear about your experiences. I might also make this a subject of a future lecture, so let me know if that's an area you're exploring. Let's talk about splitting large and small claims now. As I mentioned, this is a very common actuarial approach, with good reason, as there are so many differences throughout the policy life cycle between large and small claims. There are three key technical principles to guide you when splitting a class into large and small, and one nuance to consider also. The key decision here is what threshold to use between large and small. Principle number one, when deciding what threshold to use, is that you are trying to isolate the volatility in the large triangle. Principle number two, is that you want to have a stable triangle of small claims development. Principle number three, is that you want to have enough data from the large triangle to make it possible to model it. We're remembering the scarcity side of the balance equation here. The nuance to consider is whether to define claims as large, ever large, or excess, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So how might I make this decision? Well, I would create a chart, like we see here, which simply plots the value of each individual claim in a modelling segment in size order. Before I plot this chart, I might remove any claims which are from recent origin periods, as these might not be fully developed to ultimate. I might adjust claims to be on a consistent inflation basis too, increasing older claims and decreasing new ones. I'll often get a chart here. We have lots and lots of small claims in size, and then in the tail, I suddenly get a shooting up of claim size. If I don't get this sudden point of inflection, and I probably don't have enough large claims to make splitting this segment into large and small worthwhile or feasible. If I pick a point around about the point of inflection, then I meet principles one and two. My small triangle will be stable because I've got lots of similar claims, and the volatility from these suddenly big claims will be isolated in the large triangle. 
However, I might not have achieved principle three, as I might have too little data in my large triangle. There's no perfect answer here, but I need to get enough data into that large triangle to have enough data to draw reliable trends from it. So you may have to reduce the threshold a bit until you get sufficient data and the quantity in large. If you start getting more than 75% of your claim amounts in either the small or large triangles, then you might find it's not worth splitting large and small, since one of the triangles won't have enough data to model. Lastly, you need to consider if you want to simply call a claim large if it's bigger than the threshold at a given development period. Hence, a single claim could jump between large and small as its value increases or decreases. Or do you want to use an ever large definition where claims cannot move back into small having ever claim large? Or do you want to slice individual claims into capped and excess portions below and above the threshold? Each of these three methods is used widely in the market and each has its own benefits. The large approach puts the most data into the large triangle, which helps with principle three, but can have volatility to the small triangle as claims jump from small to large and vice versa, which counts against principle two. The capped excess approach puts less into the large triangle, but does ensure that the small triangle is stable, aiding principle two at the cost of principle three. Lastly, the ever large approach puts as much as possible into the large triangle while still maintaining stability in the small triangle. So perhaps balancing principles two and three, but it is a little more difficult to explain and to calculate. Having assessed your optimal actuarial threshold to apply, you do need to consider three other drivers of the threshold to use in practice. If you align your large threshold with the reinsurance threshold, assuming you have excess of loss reinsurance, which covers individual claims above a given excess point, then this will make allowing for reinsurance much simpler in your modelling. There may be a standard definition of the large claim within your company, and so by aligning to this, you will aid communication with key stakeholders. Lastly, you may have some benchmark information available from market sources, and so by aligning to this, you can more easily model your large, unstable claims. Again, there's no perfect answer here, and you will need to balance the needs of the modelling team against the desired uses of your modelling. As usual, you need to consider what's best for this modelling purpose, and not just do what was done last time or seems easiest. So that's everything I'd like to cover in this video on granularity. I look forward in the next video to explain to you about the preparatory steps you need to take around the internal and external factors that can on one hand distort the policy life cycle and make your life difficult, or on the other hand can really help you in modelling the policy life cycle. As usual, Please like and subscribe to support these videos. Do let me know your comments and feedback on these videos in the comments below. Thank you.